First of all, I'm Ivo Ugrina. I come from the Genos company, which almost everybody calls Genos if they're from the English part of the world. I believe Gordon told you enough this morning about Genos. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to give you a small introduction, a really short introduction into longitudinal and survival data analysis with, with aspects of what we're going to do on, in our project. I'm going to do a project with Frano, which, which, who is currently not here. So first of all, what is longitudinal and survival analysis about? It's all about time. So you, you want to have answers to some things that have time as a really important aspect of itself. For example, you're a car manufacturer, you produce motor cars, and then you want to see is there any difference in vehicle in one year, three years, 15 years after you produce it. Of course, there is some difference. People drive it and everything. You can talk about if somebody has a cancer, how long is he going to survive? And is it really important for him? Is he smoking or not smoking? If he's driving a car, if he eats like Mediterranean food or he likes huge amounts of red meat or something like that. And in the end, what you want to say is maybe, okay, it's quite hard to say that this guy is going to die in 15 years and 12 days and 16 hours. But if you could have some kind of a prediction of probability of him dying, like some kind of a curve which will say in the next 10 days the probability of him dying is 90%, 19%, then in 25 days it goes up to 30% and such things, it would be really, really, really awesome. So, Usually we have two different types of data regarding time data. The first one is called repeated measurements. So we usually call it longitudinal measurement data, which are repeated measurements of a response variable at a number of time points. As I said with cars, if you have regular car checks and you need to do it after one month, three months, then a year, that's a regular interval, that's regular time points. Or for example, as Gordon told you before, you make some measurements before the surgery, then 12 hours after the surgery, maybe seven days after the surgery. So you don't have something like survival. It's just that you measure something in some time periods, and then you want to see if there is any difference during those time periods. The other thing is regarded to survival, and it's called event history data, which are times that are recurrent or terminating events which times to recurrent or terminating events are recorded. So the survival, you get, as a medical doctor, you get somebody who's got prostate cancer, for example, and you write in your notes, okay, he came to on 2nd of August, 2014, and then he needs to come every, I don't know, month or something like that. And you just, when he dies or something happens or he doesn't die, you write it in your notes, he died after 917, days, for example. So if you have 100 people, different people with prostate cancer, which for all of them, or not all of them, but let's say some amount of them, you have like exact time that he survived, then you can do some kind of analysis about it. The first thing, as I said, is longitudinal data. And I usually say it's an easier part but it's also quite hard if, you want, if you're going to do it correctly. There are some questions that are really important. The first one is how to analyze it. So how are you going to analyze data before the surgery and data after the surgery? The second thing is how are you going to justify the results of the analysis? Of course, these questions aren't only about survival data and longitudinal data. These questions are about doing scientific research. You need to justify the results. So sometimes you need to say, okay, there is a difference in time, so maybe it comes from time, or it's just that last year the guy who was here didn't smoke, and nowadays he smokes, and that's the reason why he's getting worse or better, for example. In the end, how are you going to replicate your longitudinal data? Is it really easy to replicate some kind of disease which is not that common and you need to make measurements or something like that. This is the hardest problem, at least as, I, as I've seen in the practice, how to replicate this data. For, usually in science today, you just talk with somebody else, for example, with Janine or somebody else, and you ask them, 
Do you have data for something? With SNPs, it's much easier. But with this, you need to have like fixed intervals of time and everything. So it's quite hard to replicate some results. So one of the things that you can do about analyzing it, this is very known, this is, this is called box plot. So you could take a look at the structure, you have mean here, and you can say this is the first time before the surgery and then you have like 12 hours, 24 hours or seven days after the surgery. What can you say about different glycol profiles? These are glycans from plasma, I believe. Yes, they are. So is it decreasing? Maybe, maybe somewhere. Okay, here one could say, okay, it's maybe decreasing. Is there somewhere here maybe increasing? You can look at that like for different samples. Here we have all the samples in one single box plot. And here we have every color represents one sample. So now you can look what happens to the samples, to the people as the time goes. So maybe you can say, I don't know here, it seems that GP42 goes up during time and somewhere it needs to decrease, for example, here. So maybe you can just say then, okay, these two guys, they, they're really strange. Maybe I can see why they are strange. So it's called outliers. You're gonna take out outliers, possible outliers. Try to see, are they different from the group? Try to stratify the data. There are some more advanced methods like linear mixed effects models. I believe somebody will give a talk about that later. And there are something called generalized estimation, estimating equations. But in the end, the beginning is exploratory. And after that, you're going to use some like heavy artillery, like linear mixed effects models or something like that. With survival data, the real question is what is survival analysis? So it's basically study of random times in which you say time is equal to the duration, duration of some event or waiting for some event to happen, like guys gonna die or something like that. And applications come from health, reliability. The two guys that made some, one really popular curve, it's called Kaplan-Meier's estimator curve. One comes from basically health and the other comes from reliability. You can do it in sociology, ecology, ecology and other fields. This is an example of the results of survival analysis. So these things are called survival curves and they say at day zero probability is one, nobody's gonna die here. But as the time passes till 900 days, there is, nobody's gonna survive, okay, everybody's gonna survive, but as the time passes, people are start to, they're going to die more and more. And then you, you can just stratify it. Basic, this is called G as an example. So if you have G more or equal to 0 0.16, then your curve would be like this. Okay, so we can say this is possibly biomarker after we, if you see somebody who's got G greater than 0 0.16, then maybe you're gonna give him a new type of drug to make him survive longer. These guys, we can say they're okay, only 50% of them will in average die during time. What are, what are the possible problems with it? Usually you don't know all survival times. For example, studies last fixed time. You're gonna do a study, you're gonna do it for three years. After that, you don't have any money to follow up your people. So you don't know when exactly did they die. You, you just know they, di they didn't die in the first three years, for example. Also, patients just disappear. They don't call you, they don't care, they move to another country or something like that. Or exact times are unrecorded, unrecordable. So guy comes to you with like fourth degree or some disease and you don't know when it started. Also, he died somewhere, for example, in Africa from Ebola, and now you, you can say, okay, he died in the first 15 days, but if he died in some kind of accident that wasn't recorded, you just know that he died, but not when. 
There is a problem with censoring, as I said. That is, when an observation is incomplete due to some random cause, the cause of the censoring must be independent of the event of interest if you are to use standard methods of analysis. Okay, so censoring is, for example, when he just simply disappears. After a year and a half in the study, he is not there anymore. But you have some kind of knowledge about him. You know that he survived for a year and a half, right? There is something called truncation. It's a variant of censoring which occurs when the incomplete nature of the observation is due to a systematic selection process inherent to the study design. Too many words, definitely, but you can just imagine it like this. You have a study design and you say in your study design, I'm going to follow up my people for three years. And then after that, I'm not going to follow up them. So you truncate it at the end. Examples of sensor data, lung cancer patients are recruited to a study to test the effect of a drug on their survival from lung cancer. A takes part in the study until her death time at time TA. Her survival time is uncensored. You know when she started the study and you know when she died. B takes part in the study until time TB. He then leaves the study. His survival time is censored. You know that he survived until TB, but you don't know what happened after that. We know that it is at least TB, but we don't know it precisely. C takes part in the study until time TC. She is then hit by a car and dies. Her survival time with regard to the event of interest, namely death, through lung cancer is also censored. We know it is at least TC. This is probably the most common mistake people like medical doctors do when they do research. They completely exclude people which didn't die. But you have some kind of inf information in it. You know that he survived at least TC time. What to do with sensor data? All the sensor data, also sensor data and truncated data are only partially observed. We do not throw them away, as I said. Not only because you know something, also because some kind of mathematical and statistical methods are going to go wrong. For example, the, the variance in our estimates is going to increase if we decrease the sample size. And sometimes it leads to biased results. So the most important thing in survival analysis, one of two most important things in survival analysis is a fu survival function, which says basically this is mathematical notation that says this is a probability of surviving at least to time t. Your survival time will be greater than small t. ST is called survival function. It is defined on the domain 0 to infinity. So he, okay, it's not that realistic to be infinity, but you define it like that, it's easier from a mathematical point of view. And as a probability, it has range from 0 to 1. And the second thing is hazard function. And this is like a strange notation, but in the end it says something like this. What is the probability that if you survived till time t, you're going to die like immediately after that t? It's a hazard in the moment of t. That's why you have limit as delta t goes to zero. This looks something like maybe derivation if you know mathematical rules or something like that. There is some part missing, but the idea is basically the same. And this is called, as I said, hazard function. So the question in survival analysis is how to find appropriate hazard or survival functions. And if you go under suitable conditions, there is a beautiful model, which is, I believe it's the most popular model currently in the literature. And it's called Cox proportional hazards model. And it says something like this. The hazard can be written as something that's, that is intrinsic to the disease. So it doesn't depend on are you smoking, are you running, what do you eat. Basically, this is the hazard of the disease. And then you can make it better or worse. This part says you're going to make it better or worse. These things are called covariates. And for example, this can be, are you smoking? This can be your blood pressure level or something like that. 
mathematics or statistics, they try to estimate these things, betas, alphas, and so on. As I said, a hey Joe. Is yeah. there a quick and easy explanation of why you put it uh, in an exponent? Yeah, it's always like that in mathematics. We like beautiful functions. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah but the sign is very beautiful as well. Yeah, 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 it is. But exponential function is really beautiful one. It, derivatives are pretty. You can do a lot of things with it. Also, you can fall into some kind of already known analysis. But in the end, it's also got some something to do with some kind of Poisson distribution and some other things which are not. I, I cannot explain it here, but I can tell you later on the paper. They are available, actually, and people are taking notes. Yeah. There is an explanation for it, but in the end, just look at it. Mathematics likes pretty things. That's why you, that's why you define variance with square and not absolute value. You cannot derive absolute values, but squares, you love them. And in the end, it's almost the same. Almost the same. OK. This part is uh, the t is time, alpha is some unknown parameter. So this is baseline hazard function depends on time, but not covariates. As you can see, there is no t in the other part. This is just a mathematical notation for this thing here, where x is a vector containing x1 to xn, and beta is a vector containing beta1 to beta n. So this depends on covariates, but not on time. There is no t part there. Alphas are parameters for baseline hazard, and betas are parameters for covariance effects. So as you look at it like this, nobody would say, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. Right? It's just another mathematical notation, another formula. But the pretty thing about Cox's proportional hazard model is this. You can define something that's called hazard ratio. Thank you, Leonard. So if you take hazards and make a ratio out of them, and I just need to close this, sorry, okay. Then it's written, and for example, x can be only one covariate. You take this part and write it here. You see these things are the same, so you can just discard them. You get these things. So if you write them like this, it's easier to see. So the thing is that since you have hazard, which is intrinsic to the disease, it goes away. But if this guy is smoking and this is not smoking, then you have a hazard ratio of if you smoke regarding to the guy that doesn't smoke, how much more likely are you to get the disease or die? So most of you will, during your science or your university degrees, you're going to see HR in the papers. That's hazard ratio. And this is the prettiest part about Cox's proportional hazard model. As I said, this doesn't depend on time. And this is the hazard ratio comparing x1 to x2. OK. So I've introduced survival analysis and longitudinal analysis. And now I'm going to introduce something that is quite new. And it, it usually isn't part of at least I don't know even one book that introduces it. So I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna talk about something that's called tensors, but before tensors, I'm just gonna say what a matrix is. I believe everybody knows what a matrix is. It's just some mathematical structure. You put some numbers inside, it looks like rectangular and everything beautiful. The thing is that you can put in rows, row names for example, that could be samples, for example, sick people. And in columns, you can put covariates, age, gender, or whatever. So you have nice representation as in, as in Excel, for example. You're used to that, I believe. You have rows, and then you say the first row will be this guy, the second row will be that guy. And on columns, you have different measurements. In glycomics, you'll have dif different measurements. In metabolomics, you'll have different measurements. But the thing is, what to do with time here? Where are you going to put your time? So just. Use your imagination. What if you could, from 2D, go to 3D and say, OK, this is my normal matrix, this blue one, but different time periods are going to be put as another matrix behind it. So this is a tensor. 
you have 3D structure or more dimensional structure, not only 2D structure. And in the project I'm going to lead, we're going to try to apply tensors to time data with two different techniques. The first one is called CP decomposition. The idea is to decompose that 3D thing into different simpler things which will describe different parts of the beginning, for example, describe sick people, describe covariates and describe time points. This, it can be done like this or like this. This is an example that is used when somebody recommends movies to you. So if you like movies and you use some kind of recommendation system, and I would definitely suggest everybody who doesn't use recommendation systems that they should start using it. Even Leonard, you can always use pseudonyms, so it's not a problem. So if you have users, as rows, movies, as columns, and then you have context, is the third part. You can decompose this thing into a smaller, which is called core tensor, and matrix, matrix, matrix. And this matrix will tell you something about movies. This will tell you something about users, and this one will tell you something about context. So we're going to try to do that with time data. About the project, analysis of longitudinal data regarding difference in glycosylation before and after surgery. I basically need one student for this, and it's going to be done in three or four days, mostly. Analysis of survival data from Croatian island reef contains different omics data, and I'm going to do, do it with everybody because I believe Cox proportional hazard model should be learned by everybody and an, app an application of tensor decompositions to time and omics data. It's, it's also going to mostly be done by one student in the first four or five days, and that's basically it. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I believe later at 4.30 or something, half past four, we're going to have some kind of circling around, so you can just write all the questions you have till then, and then we're going to be in different rooms so you can ask everybody something about their project. That's it, basically. No questions? Yeah, yeah, please, Athena. Um, so, Athena, you have a lecture on tensor decomposition? Yeah, I'm going to give a lecture on PCA and tensor decompositions in three or four days, I believe. <coughs> I'll ask a question anyway. I think you might answer it then. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Is it really equivalent? Well, you know, there are like there are like a gazillion different matrix factorizations, so yeah. it depends. The standard one, which are basically everybody knows about it, is called SVD, singular value decomposition, and PCA is an example of that. And this one is called higher order singular value decomposition. Okay. This one here. The thing is that I'm gonna talk about it in the later in three or four days. The thing is that the matrices are really pretty. So deriving the results, mathematical results about matrices is hard, but it's much easier than doing it for tensors. So with, with something called SVD, one can have a theorem that says if you want to reduce dimension, then the best thing to do is to do SVD and take the first, for example, R vectors. With tensors, you, you don't have a result like that. So, Tensors are useful, but they're mostly exploratory analysis. Simply, there are no strong theoretical, like really strong theorems that are going to say, okay, if you do this, then you get the best least squared estimation or something. The thing is that in functional analysis, you can prove that the tensors aren't a closed space, then tensors that are rank two can go to a rank three just of a sudden. So it's basically almost impossible. But we can talk about it later from a mathematical point of view. Any more questions? Okay, if not, I'm going to stop.